Hope Church this morning. It's really great that you could join us here today. Um, thanks to those of you who are joining us online. It's great that you can join us as well. Um, we're going to start our service like we always do in praise of our God. And um, this song is really excellent. Um, it tells us, encourages us to rejoice, to lift our hands, to praise our great God, regardless of our life situations at the moment, in our sickness, in our sorrows, in our extravagant joy. Let's stand and rejoice together.
Father in heaven, Son of God, Holy Spirit living in us now, uh, we thank you for all your blessings to us and and we are reminded this morning especially, first and foremost, of how good it is to be loved by the Lamb of God. 
who is willing to die in our place so that we could be right with you, God. Thank you for forgiving us of all of our sins, for dealing with all the, all the muck, all, the, all that's wrong in our world. Thank you for the hope of eternal life, the hope of a restored and renewed creation when, when all, of the, all of the bad is a distant memory. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Please grab a seat. Welcome to our service today. My name's Andrew, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our uh, service this morning. Um, in, in the kind of traditional church calendar of the year, there's a few big events, a few feasts and festivals uh, that have existed throughout history. Christmas and Easter are two obvious ones. But another one is this thing called Pentecost Sunday, which is today, the day where we kind of uh, celebrate every year the uh, arrival of the Spirit amongst God's people. Um, in Joel chapter 2, God promises um, that, that one day He will pour out His Spirit on His people. And we see that fulfilled in the story of Jesus and His apostles uh, on the day of Pentecost. Uh, and I'm going to pray now um, for uh, along those lines. Would you pray with me? Uh, God in heaven, we thank you that you've given us your spirit. Uh, we are so thankful that you, um, though, though Christ is bodily absent from us, he is with us still spiritually by the spirit, by the helper and the comforter that he promised he would send to his apostles and disciples. And we ask that your spirit would, would be a real presence in our lives reminding us of, of what sin is, correcting our paths, leading us towards behavior that is godly, uh, filling us with joy and rejoicing in both the ups and the downs of life. Thank you for sending your spirit uh, as, a, as a witness to us that you are the God who loves us and empowering us for mission in your world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A couple of announcements for you today. Uh, the first one is about equip. Uh, the Women's Conference Equip. Equip is a women's conference. It's um, existed for um, about two decades now. Um, it is, um, it's, its goal is to give helpful, solid, heart-filling Bible teaching from women for women. Um, every year, almost 6,000 women uh, attend that conference. Um, and um, this year's theme is on the theme of comfort. I think something appropriate coming out of um, a few years of lockdown and kind of just a a generally low mood throughout our world in a lot of ways, uh, looking at the often forgotten book of Lamentations. So um, it'll be really helpful teaching this year, really appropriate. Um, the conference itself was on the 18th of June. There'll be a group meeting here at church, so you can come along here uh, to view those sessions. Uh, two things you need to do if you want to come. The first is to rego on the website, so uh, equip.org.au. Go to the website and rego. Uh, the second thing is to let and no, and is up the back. Um, if you're not sure who she is, that's her. Um, let her know you're coming, just so that um, catering and numbers and things like that can be firmed up. Okay, so Rego on the website. Let Ange know that you're coming to equip. Uh, Dan's got our second announcement. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, we talked about this last week, um, uh, but next week is our Thanksgiving Sunday. It's a Sunday we set aside uh, every year to particularly thank, think, focus on being thankful. And uh, a part of that, um, as part of we think about um, having a generous heart, we, we th uh, every year we offer an opportunity for an extra uh, giving opportunity, uh, a Thanksgiving offertory. And uh, on your chairs this week, we have these little envelopes. Uh, they are a sample of what we will hand out next week. Um, and part of this, we, what we will do is have an opportunity for people to fill that out during the service and, um, and hand it in at the end. Now, obviously, uh, in the world of digital giving, people give a lot through online, and that's fine. There is an opportunity to write credit card details down if that's a helpful way to go, but you can just do the transfer and, and just write it down on here as part of our expression of thanks. So we, uh, we talk about this leading up to Thanksgiving so that people can talk about it in their, with their spouse and, uh, and plan. But on the week, next week, we want to focus on Thanksgiving, not on giving. And so we're going to um, not talk much about it next week. Uh, so I'm encouraging you to talk about this during the week uh, with, with your spouse or, uh, or figure out and prayerfully consider what you would give. And uh, three projects we're doing. Uh, this year, um, sorry, there's four things. One is, a, is, is three projects as a building project. 
which is our updating our street signs, which don't include 5 p.m. on them yet. Update uh, fixing up the entrance way to the lower hall, which is done partially with a government grant and painting the chapel. So those are three things that we're inviting people to give towards. The fourth thing is our scripture fund, uh, which uh, helps fund scripture in local schools. Am I right that giving to the scripture fund is a tax deductible right. gift, Dan? Yeah, great. Um, just something to take into account. Um, on the topic of giving, uh, of course, every week we, as, as part of our worship, as an opportunity of joyful worship towards God, um, we encourage you to give. Um, the, all the work that happens here at our church is funded by uh, the giving of people within the church. There's no magic pot of money that the Anglican Diocese has that pays for <laughs> Dan and Miles and I to uh, work here at church. Um, so um, thank you to those who give online. We encourage people to do it that way. We think it's a helpful way to do it for many reasons. Uh, if you prefer to do so through cash, there is a, a black Perspex box near the door uh, that you'll see uh, on, on the way out. One last announcement. Um, in the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 12, uh, Paul there is teaching um, this profound truth about the fact that we, as the, the body of Christ, we are a body. We're all parts, but we are united together in a body because of Christ. And then he goes on to say, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. Some of you will know that on our Thursday night, Daniel and Becky Maharaja's three-year-old daughter, Abby, had a stroke and is currently being treated at Westmead Children's Hospital. Uh, many of you will know Dan and Becky. Uh, they attend our Quakers Hill campus. Uh, Becky is Jeff and Kim Bates's daughter. Um, Abby has been in and out of the ICU in her time at the hospital. Um, the day after the stroke on Friday, uh, her uh, speech was still impaired and uh, movement on one half of her body was uh, impaired as well, but the prognosis was looking very good. Um, things have been up and down since then. Uh, Abby had a seizure on Friday uh, night and she was taken back into the ICU from the wards. Uh, scans showed that she hadn't had another stroke, which was what was suspected, which is very good news. Um, and she's expected to return to the wards from the ICU fairly quickly while the doctors continue to investigate uh, what the cause of the issues is. Um, Marin is going to come and pray for them now. Thanks, Marin. Um, so <coughs> um, Dana and Becky and their family are very close to our hearts, so please pray um, with me as we pray for Abby. Uh, dear Lord, we pray right now for Abby Maharaj. We pray that you would be healing her, give wisdom and, um, and patience and good understanding to the doctors. I pray that you would be, um, yeah, have your healing hand on them, on, on, the, on Abby, sorry, um, and your guidance to the doctors. I pray that you would be healing little Abby's body um, quickly and um, completely. We pray this knowing that you are good and you are gracious and merciful um, and love Abby. And we pray that um, Abby would feel the love of you as she's going through this um, uncertain time. And whatever it is that she is aware of going on at the moment, Lord, I pray that you would be um, yeah, comforting her, um, showering her in your love and your blessing. Uh, Lord, we pray for Daniel and Becky and for their other children, Levi and Hannah. We pray that you would be uh, encouraging them, um, supporting them, um, pouring your love onto them, giving them peace, giving them um, a sure foundation in your love um, and knowing that you are good all the time. Uh, I pray that you would be you know, helping um, us as the body of Christ, as their church family, to be uplifting them in prayer um, and keeping them on our on our hearts. Um, and Lord, once again, we pray that you would heal Abby and heal her quickly and bring her back to be the joyful, bouncy little girl that she is. Um, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Laura's going to keep praying for us now. Hey, friends, would you continue to bow your head with me and let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much that we have the freedom to come to church and to serve you today and to pray. Lord, we pray for the work that Compassion is doing in El Salvador. We pray that God would provide a way for Eva to fulfill his dream of becoming a doctor. We pray for courage for Hector as he shares God's love with his family. Pray that God would provide stable jobs 
for Nayali's parents and we pray for comfort as Edwin grieves the passing of his father. Pray that God would provide um, a safe home for Samuel and his family and we pray for an end to gang violence in El Salvador. We also pray for the war that's happening in Ukraine, Lord. Please support global leaders and help them to take uh, to find peace um, so that people of Ukraine can go back to living their lives. And help them through all of this sadness to see that you're a God who loves them and a God who died for them so that they might live. We pray for the women's event equip coming up, Lord. I pray that women would hear your word. Pray that new women would come to you, Christ, and love you. But we also pray for current Christians that they would be reminded of the joy that they have in Jesus. We bring before you Thanksgiving Sunday. Help us to have a generous heart and to be prayerfully thinking throughout this week of what we can be giving next week, Lord. I pray that we will be striving as a community to continue to build so that Riverston and beyond will hear your word. We bring before you Miles as he preaches today, Lord. Please be speaking through him. And for us as a congregation, help us that we would have ears to hear your gospel. Amen. Good morning. I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 to 15, if you'd like to find that in your Bible apps or your Bibles. You might have received a Bible when you came in this morning. That's our gift to you to keep. Um, Please feel free to pass that on if you've already got a Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through to 15. I hope you will put up with me in a little foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you received a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. I do not think I am in the least inferior to those super apostles. I may indeed be untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in the regions of Achaia will stop this boasting of mine. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. And I will keep on doing what I'm doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Here ends the reading. Great, thanks Austin. Hey everyone. It is really good that you're here. My name's Miles. Welcome again if you're here. Welcome if you're joining us online. Uh, It's preaching time, so we're going to unpack that passage that Austin just read out for us. Uh, So with that in mind... Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, your word to us is life-giving and life-changing, and we ask that today as we spend time in it, that it would impact us in that way, that we might all leave this building or leave this room 
as people who love you and know you and understand you and cherish you more than when we walked in today. Amen. Well, now there are things in life that you are good at and things in life that you're not so good at. I'm pretty good at eating. It's a skill that I have uh, developed over my whole life. I'm not very good at eating two fruit and five veg. I don't know if you feel the same way. I find that really hard. I'm pretty good at buying plants, new ones for me, or perhaps as gifts for my wife, Morgan. I'm not very good at looking after plants. And, you know, I just kind of forget about them, and then they die. And if I'm honest, I don't care that much. But then, a few months later, I'll reconvince myself that next time's going to be different, and so I buy some more, and then the cycle just starts all over again. Good at some things, not so good at other things. One of the things that I'm pretty good at is being a fool sometimes. If you've been around here at church for a while, uh, I've been telling stories about my life when I preach sometimes. You would have heard about me getting a ski pole up my nose. You would have heard about me getting locked in a bathroom in a Scottish castle in the middle of winter. You would have heard about me getting lost on a four-day hike and sleeping on top of nettles. So many stories about me being a fool. If you missed those ones, come find me after I can tell you those stories. I asked Morgan yesterday, my wife, you know, uh, if she could think of any more stories where I was a fool. She could. Um, quite a few. And, you know, maybe you're hearing this. And you're like, wow, Miles, that sounds so great. I want to be more like you. I want to be more foolish. Well, if that's you today, you're in for a treat. Because here's the question that we're going to answer today. How can you become a fool? What, what strategies could you employ to maximize your foolishness? On the spectrum of wisdom to foolishness, how do we get over here the best way? If you want to become a fool, do that. But if you did, that's the thing that we're going to do. And the way we're going to answer that question is through this passage. Now, as we spend time in 2 Corinthians, we've seen that Paul uh, went to this church. He shared the gospel. There's this new church that started. And then he left to go and do the same thing elsewhere, and things started falling apart. Because these false teachers came in and started teaching a different gospel, a false gospel. And for these false teachers to gain traction, they needed to discredit Paul and his ministry. So that's what they did. And last week, if you were here in preaching time, we looked at chapter 10, where Paul started to defend his reputation. And if you're here, you remember, one of the questions we answered was, why does Paul defend his reputation? Is it for his sake so that he can win? No, it's the opposite. He defends it for the Corinthians' sake, that they might share in Christ's victory by standing firm in the true gospel. By defending his reputation, Paul's defending the true gospel that he originally shared with them. And you might also remember, Paul, he doesn't want to have to do this. He doesn't want to have to boast and defend his reputation. He thinks it's foolish to boast in himself. That's why you might have noticed in our passage today, verse 1, he says, Bear with me in a little foolishness. Bear with me as I do that annoying boasting thing that your false teachers are all doing. It's like Paul stooping to their level. But he's going to do it because... This stuff matters. Holding on to the true gospel matters. It's literally a matter of life and death. And so here in chapter 11, Paul exposes the Corinthians' foolishness in trusting these false teachers. And so we're going to learn how to be a fool. The first thing you want to do, if you wanted to be more foolish, you would need to ignore people who love you. Halfway through the chapter in verse 11, Paul is real clear that he loves the Corinthians. He says, you reckon I don't love you? No, God knows that I do. 
But he also says it in another way in verse 2. Paul uses this analogy of marriage. In this analogy, Paul is like the, the loving father of the engaged daughter. And the engaged daughter is the Corinthian church. And as was culturally relevant in their society, it was the father's duty to ensure that his engaged daughter got to the wedding day without her running off with some other guy. And in this analogy, the Corinthians, they are engaged to Jesus. And they're in real danger of running off with someone else. Now, that might sound a bit weird, being married to Jesus. But actually, that's language that the Bible uses quite often, that the church is the bride and that Jesus is the husband. And the point of that image is to highlight this loving and committed relationship or covenants between Jesus and the church. One example you might have heard of before, Ephesians chapter 5, uh, husbands are commanded to love their wives just as Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so here's Paul. He's using this church, Jesus, marriage idea. And Paul is like this loving, committed father of the bride. He wants the best for his daughter, the Corinthian church. And what's best for them, or what's best for everyone, is to be married or to be united with Jesus. That Jesus' death and resurrection would count for them. But they're not listening to Paul. They're ignoring their, their loving father and they're running off with these false teachers who have their own interests at heart. They're ignoring someone who loves them. And with that in mind, it just it makes sense, doesn't it, for Paul to also say in verse 2 that he is rightly jealous for them. Did you notice that word? That he's jealous. To be jealous means that something of yours is under threat by someone else. And here, Paul's precious Corinthian brothers and sisters in Christ are under threat of being taken away from Jesus by these false teachers. And so he desperately wants them to come back. He yearns for them to ditch these false teachers. And so if you want to be foolish... If you want to be really foolish, then you should ignore the people that love you. We'll come back to what that might actually look like, look like later. Second strategy to become foolish. Don't treasure the truth of the gospel. Instead, just be content with lies. If you want to be a fool, just do that. You can see what that looks like in verses 3 to 4. I'll read these out again. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. In Genesis chapter 3, in the Garden of Eden, Eve was deceived by Satan. And she and Adam ate the apple that they weren't supposed to, that God commanded them not to. They believed Satan's lies and were led astray. And Paul's like, that's what's going on here in the church. And that then sets up, I think, one of Paul's most brutal verses in this whole letter. Verse 4. He starts by being brutal to the Corinthians. He says... If someone comes to you and preaches anything different, you just put up with it easily enough. You know, you're weak. Your minds are frail. You get tossed around by the wind. Anything else that comes your way and you just accept it. But it gets even more brutal because by equating all of this to Genesis chapter 3, the Corinthians are like Eve, right? They've been deceived. So who who is like Satan? Well, it's the false teachers. Because like Satan, they have deceived the Corinthians and drawn them away from the truth. 
And Paul says that much more explicitly in verses 12 to 15. And so what do you think about that? Is that fair to equate these false teachers with Satan? Do you reckon Paul's gone a bit too far with that? Well, what, what is Satan's strategy? What's his weapon? What's well, lies? Jesus calls him the father of lies. But not always big fancy lies. Like it's not always God isn't real. Sometimes Satan is gentle and crafty and clever. And he tells lies that deviate from the truth just a little bit. Like in the Garden of Eden. What does Satan say to Eve? Does he say, oh, no, 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 God's wrong. You shouldn't listen to him. Listen to me. I'm the best. That's not what Satan says, does he? He says, hang on, Eve. Did God, did God really say that? Just double check. I just want to make sure that that's what God really said. And then he manipulates Eve's response to that as well. He's crafty. He's clever. And it sounds like that's what these false teachers are doing. They're being crafty. They're deviating from the truth. They're undermining Paul's reputation. They're using the same tactics as Satan. Now, does that mean that when anyone ever lies, they're then in league with Satan? No. But if someone is intentionally blurring and intentionally tweaking the gospel to draw people away from Jesus for their own sake, that's exactly what Satan's trying to do as well. And so although verse 4 is pretty harsh, it's true. And what the Corinthians desperately need right now is the truth. And so if you want to be more foolish, don't worry about treasuring the truth of the gospel. Just be content with lies. Third strategy to become more foolish. You should respect and follow those who exploit you and exploit the gospel. You should do that if you want to be a fool. In verse 5, Paul, you might have noticed, calls these false teachers super apostles. And it really captures the idea, doesn't it? These super apostles are impressive and they're showy and it's all about them and their prestige. And we see an example in verse 7. In those days, it was quite common for speakers to come along and charge money uh, for people to listen to them speak. And the better or the more impressive the speakers were, the more money was charged. Which also means that if a speaker didn't charge any money, probably not that good. But then along comes Paul. And this is Paul, right? The guy who met Jesus. The guy who Jesus commanded to go spread the gospel. The guy who's bringing the most precious and relevant message the Corinthians would ever encounter. And Paul doesn't charge any money. And the reason is, you can see it in verse 8 and 9, he didn't want to be a burden. He'd rather rely on the support of other churches who were mission-minded and keen to support the spread of the gospel. But it sounds like that kind of backfired because these super apostles, they have charged money for people to listen to them. And so that means they must be more impressive than Paul, right? Imagine, imagine two new cafes opened in Riverston. Please, Lord, would that happen? Imagine two new cafes. Cafe A decides their strategy, they're going to do the best coffee ever. Well-trained baristas, high-quality beans, well-maintained machines, different milks, latte art, the goods, and they're going to be a blessing to the community and just give it away for free. Free coffee. They've got some supporters who love what they're doing. Free coffee. That's Cafe A. Sounds great. Cafe B, their strategy, they want to make heaps of money. And so they are going to charge like the normal price, four bucks, small flat white, except they're going to use international roast instant coffee and they're going to use UHT long-life milk and serve it in polystyrene cups. 
like a horror movie. Here's what's happening with the Corinthians. It's like they've gone to both cafes, they've tried both coffees, and they've decided that because Cafe A is free, they're not going to go there anymore. But because Cafe B charges money like everywhere else, that's the cafe that, that's going to become their regular. Crazy, right? Can you see that madness? How foolish. How much more foolish when we're not talking about coffee, but when we're talking about the gospel? When we're talking about the good news of Jesus Christ, death and resurrection that brings life and salvation to anyone who would follow him. How much more foolish are the Corinthians who are giving up the true gospel for some international roast, dirt, false gospel? You see, it's crazy. The Corinthians have decided to follow and respect these super apostles who are just out to exploit them because that's just the normal thing that happens. And so if you want to grow in your foolishness, if you want to be more of a fool, you should respect and follow those who exploit you and the gospel. And so there you have it. You want to be a fool? You want to grow in your foolishness? There are the steps you can take. You can ignore those who love you. Don't treasure the truth of the gospel. Make sure you follow someone who exploits you. Maybe, though, just maybe, maybe you don't want to be a fool. Maybe instead of moving down the spectrum to, to foolishness, you want to go the other way. You want to go towards Wisdom, to gospel-shaped wisdom. How would you do that? Well, surely you would just do the opposite of everything that we've just said, wouldn't you? And what would the opposite of each one then look like? If a fool ignores those who love them, a wise person listens to those who love them. Now, of course, God loves us, he demonstrates his love for us at the cross, and we should listen to what he says. But that's not what, what we're talking about here. We're talking about listening to people who love you, just like in the chapter. And so if you want to be wise, you should listen to those who love you, who want to see your faith in Jesus cultivated and growing, that you might become more like Jesus. And sometimes, you know, that love will look like encouragement, and celebrating with you as your faith in Jesus grows. Sometimes that love will look like raising questions or thoughts or ideas as you, as you navigate how to follow Jesus in all the complexities of life. And sometimes that love might even look like Paul's love for the Corinthians, confronting them about their departure from the truth and bringing them back at any cost. Sometimes that love is rescuing us from rock bottom. You know, we're drinking international roast and we're in dire need of salvation. I'll, I'll help you out with that one. But that's the kind of love that we're looking for, the kind of love that we need if we want to be wise. And so where might you find it? Where would you find this love? Where do you find that person or those people who will love us in that way and who we can listen to? Some of us are very blessed and already have that person in our lives, but not all of us would. And so where do we find those people? You're already in the right place. Right here at church. You know, there's a famous passage in 1 Corinthians that said at all the weddings, you've probably heard it, you know, love is patient. Love is kind, keeps no record of wrong, and love protects, love never fails, so on. It's all about love. Do you know what that passage is about? It's not about weddings. It's about church. It's about gathering together as God's people. Paul's like, hey, this is what church should be like. This is the kind of love that church should have. Churches are meant to be places where we love one another in that way. Like I love you. And that's not weird. 
Like, it's not weird for your minister to say that. Of course it's true. Of course I should. I'm supposed to love you in the way that 1 Corinthians 13 talks about love. I want to see you grow in your faith in Jesus, and I hope you feel the same way about me too. And so if you want to be wise, and you, and you, if you want to be wise, you need people who can love you. And if that's true, then you're in the right place. Church is a place to find those people. Life groups are an even better place to find those people, meeting in smaller groups. And of course, as you are loved and as you listen to your brothers and sisters in Christ, it's right for you to then reciprocate that and to love them back and to speak wisdom into their lives. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be so good if our church was filled with people who loved one another in this way, who wanted to see each other grow in faith and who spoke wisdom into each other's lives and who were humble enough to listen to that wisdom from others. If that happened, we would be a very wise church indeed. Now, having said that, just notice I picked my words very carefully. I didn't say that you should obey people who love you without question. No, no, you should listen to those who love you. And that's just worth emphasizing because no one gets this right all the time. Like, I love my wife, Morgan, and I don't always speak wisdom into her life. Sometimes I get it wrong. And in the same way, churches are supposed to be places filled with people who love one another, but churches don't always get it right. Church leaders don't always get it right. But if you want to be wise, you should listen to those who love you and you're in the right place. Second one, much shorter. A fool settles for lies about the gospel, but a wise person treasures the truth of the gospel. You know, church history is so interesting. It's filled with people treasuring the gospel, which meant that they were questioning and clarifying and sharpening their understanding of the Lord Jesus and everything that he is and everything that he has done. And we should be so thankful for them. They fought a lot of battles and they did a lot of hard work. But we need to continue to do the same. We need to continue to question and clarify and sharpen our own understanding of the gospel so that we can stand firm in it when any kind of resistance comes our way. And again, being at church, being in life group, that's a great starting point. You're already doing the wise thing by being here or by tuning in, sitting under God's word. And so if you want to be wise, you should treasure the truth of the gospel. And third, last one. A fool would trust someone who wants to exploit them, but a wise person would expose those who exploit the gospel for personal gain. Such a sad reality, isn't it, that in our world... Some church leaders exploit the gospel and people for personal gain. And it's not just over there, it's in Australia, even in Anglican churches in Sydney. We aren't immune to that. And so then what do you do with this one? How might you go about exposing church leaders who get this wrong? I think the answer is quite simple. If you ever suspect that myself or Dan or Andrew or Melissa or any church leader is exploiting the gospel or exploiting people for personal gain, then we need you to love us and speak that wisdom into our lives or speak that wisdom into the appropriate person's lives. Because our church, like, it cannot be a place that is about miles or four miles. No, our church is a place about Jesus. Everything we do needs to be about Jesus. 
Our church needs to be a place about connecting people with Jesus and, and cultivating each other's faith in Jesus and celebrating our faith in Jesus together. And so if you notice that something's not happening, then you need to love us and speak that wisdom into our lives. It's really easy to be a fool, isn't it? But we don't want to be fools. We want to be wise. We want gospel-shaped wisdom. And so what we learn from 2 Corinthians 11 is that for us to be wise, we need to listen to those who love us. We need to treasure the truth of the gospel. And we need to expose those who are exploiting the gospel for personal gain. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, 2 Corinthians is such a rich letter. There's so much to learn and consider. And we pray that as we finish up and leave this place, that you would work in our hearts and our minds and our memories, that we would remember what your word says about how to be wise and that, that we would respond and do it. Help us, Father, to be a church that loves and listens to one another. Help us to be a church that treasures your gospel and help us to be a church that recognizes and exposes those who exploit the gospel for personal gain. Amen. Thanks, Miles. Um, As we finish up our service today, let's... Um, let's uh, encourage each other and um, remind each other of what it is that we are believing and what the truth is of the gospel um, so that we never fall away and never fall, um, you know, never be just taken away by false gospels. Let's stand and um, sing through what it is that Jesus has done for us. Traded perfection, the truth for a lie, and your glory was veiled in shame. But a promise made, a blessing you gave to a people of your name. For the broken world, a savior foretold to bear all our grief and pain.
been good to be reminded today, isn't it, of the, um, the central, absolute, essential importance, but also beauty of the gospel that means we are forgiven and right with God. Um, may we never lose sight of that truth. Um, please stick around for uh, morning tea this morning. Thanks for being here today. <laughs>